welcome to Polaris Live. This is your host, Sarwar Kashmiri, and I'd like to welcome our viewers from around the world to a new series, 30-minute conversations with global experts on the United States-China relationship, the most consequential issue of the 21st century. This series is being held under the auspices of the Foreign Policy Association, which will publish a report on these proceedings later this summer and forward it to the administration and policymakers in Washington. With a new American president, there is an opportunity to recalibrate or fine tune US strategy for China to reflect today's reality, to try and stop the slide into dangerous competition between today's two superpowers, America and China. In this opening episode of the series, Polaris Live has invited one of today's most eminent historians of China to place the U.S.-China conflict into perspective and to frame the conversations that follow. So at this point, let me introduce my interlocutor, Professor Pamela Crossley. She is the Charles and Alfred Collins Professor of History at Dartmouth College. She's a specialist on the Qing Empire and modern Chinese history and also researches and writes on Central and Inner Asian history. She's the author of eight books, including China's Global Empire, Qing, 1636 to 1912, Hammer and Anvil, Nomad Rulers at the Forge of the Modern World, and The Wobbling Pivot, China since 1800. She is an original appointee of the Dartmouth Society of Fellows. Her written commentary has appeared in popular publications, including Foreign Policy, China File, the London Review of Books, The New Republic, New York Times, Book Review, uh, The National Interest, Wall Street Journal, and Foreign Policy. I could go on, but allow me now to present Professor Pamela Crossley. Good morning. How are you? Good. Good morning, Professor Crossley. Sorry about this uh, internet uh, uh, decay. For some reason, all of the internet uh, it, it was off the air, but we are back again. And I'm glad to have you here. And I'm glad to have, have us start this series with a perspective, historical perspective from you, because you know China better than, better than most people. So what I'm going to do as you know, this series is going to talk to experts from Asia, the European Union, the United States, to see what we might be able to propose to the incoming administration. And I just thought it would be very helpful if we could start this series, which will stretch over three months, as you know, by having you frame, put a historical frame on the competition that is ongoing today between China and the United States. So let me preface this by saying that, that in your study of China, can you think of a time or times perhaps where China had been so powerful and so rich? Uh, and I'm trying to think about when that might be, how China behaved with its uh, neighbors, uh, how it, treated its neighbors, whether uh, it wanted them as vassals, whether it wanted them as friends. Can you shed some light about China's behavior when it was in such a position in a prior time? Um, I, I think I can. It's a little bit difficult to start there because you're, what you're uh, referring to, you're describing most of Chinese history, right? Ah. So if we're thinking you know, 30 centuries of Chinese history, let's say, there was a one little century sort of between 1850 and uh, 19, well, more than a century, but let's say between 1850 and, and uh, 1983, in which um, uh, there was a deviation from that pattern. And China, you know, share of global GDP may have fallen as low as 5% in that interim. But normally, it would always have been some of the population living within the territory we consider China now. It would always have been, um, you know, 20, 25, maybe a little higher percent of uh, <clears throat> global population and global GDP. Right. So today, I mean, this is, 
I don't want to say a return to normal. History doesn't actually do that. But um, <laughs> a lot of what's going on now is just really consistent with all of Chinese history. So, um, so first of all, the, the, when you ask to point to a time, well, that would be the time, 29 out of 30 centuries in Chinese history. Um, uh, so you had further question about what, characterizing these relations? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the Wall Street Journal yesterday, uh, don't mind if I call you Pamela. So uh, the Wall Street Journal yesterday uh, had a front page story that said for the first time ever, uh, inward investment in China now exceeds that in America. I mean, this has never happened before, right? We also look at uh, uh, the fact that if, depending on how you count the gross domestic product of China and the US, uh, if you count it in terms of purchasing power parity, which a lot of economists think is the proper way to do it, then China is already with a larger GDP than the United States. A lot of uh, military authorities say that uh, it's impossible in times of conflict now for American Navy to be within a thousand kilometers of China. So given all of this, given all of this, right? I mean, is it natural that China should behave in an antagonistic, highly competitive way? Or is there something in the American psyche which doesn't allow for another superpower to rise that causes this to happen. And I'm just trying to think whether this kind of behavior has happened before and we might learn something to lessen tensions today from history. Yeah. I think I see what you're saying. I'm going to have to qualify this a little bit. I mean, we have a lot of really unique uh, conditions in the 21st century, most of them related to technology, military right. technology patterns of movement and so on. So the scale of anything we refer to wouldn't really compare to today. And then to a certain extent, quantity is going to affect quality. But um, I think there's two things to say because they're very well known to people. One is the emergence uh, in an elementary way in the Han period 2000 years ago, and then developing from about a thousand years ago through the Qing period, this so-called a tributary system, right? Right. Uh, which uh, actually historically there wasn't any tributary system, but the way people conceive of it acting is that China is somehow a, at the kind of moral uh, center of uh, either the world or at least the, the world known to China at the time. So Eurasia, East Asia, um, um, Indian Ocean and so on. And that all the other countries that want to participate in that conform themselves to this kind of ideology in which China is superior. The ruler of China is the son of heaven. That's a unique sort of position. Awesome. And uh, everybody else will just sort of be nice, uh, get into these trade relationships and so on. Um, the easiest way to dispel in the minds of people who are not historians the, the idea that this was ever real is simply to say if this were a system it would have predicted the nature of relations between China and these other participating societies. So you would actually, you would be able to understand what the re those relations would be just by saying, oh, they're in the tributary system. But there wasn't, there's any way to do that. In fact, the, the, the lists that were kept at the Chinese court of the nations that were permitted to send ambassadors. And these ambassadors on, on arriving would perform some uh, so-called guest ritual that was a very ancient sort of thing. So these were, excuse me for interrupting, but these were ambassadors in the modern sense of ambassadors. They represented their uh, their countries and were given diplomatic status and was... Well, so you, you couldn't represent countries. They represent their sovereigns, right? Ah. So we're talking about medieval, early modern period, um, the imperial period. They would represent their sovereigns and they would arrive and they would um, express something along the lines of their sovereign acknowledging the superiority of the son of heaven, you know, who happened to be located in China. But what I'm saying is that those, they did keep lists, excuse me, they did keep lists and there were rituals. That was all true, but um, there was no system. Um, mostly this was a, 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 a preface to establishing trade relations okay. um, between China and these other countries. So if you wanted to participate, you would have to come, you would bring um, samples of your wares and then these right. would be tribute that you were giving to the emperor. Right. Uh, 
but uh, within that, let's say we're looking at the Qing period, let's say, um, the, the relations are of very, very different qualities. So you could find a case like Korea, um, which was involved in a pretty coercive relationship with China for the entire Qing period. Um, because it's, its history with the Qing court was different from its relations with China. Or right. a place like Vietnam, in which uh, there really was not a lot of interest on the part of China in interfering in the politics of the, the, the Dai Viet court or anything happening, even though, you know, the, 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 the sovereign would ask for a Chinese intervention, it, it often wouldn't come. Um, and in most of the other cases, just a complete indifference, perhaps not even very much serious knowledge about where these places actually were or what- uh, was question, question here, uh, uh, Professor Crossley, is it your understanding that trade and commerce largely drove the behavior of China or did it try when it really was so influential and rich to uh, to push its ideology into other countries and as a as a second part to this if you could speak about uh, the relationship uh, historical uh, rate taiwan uh, and yeah. uh, and china yeah. well um just the actually part of the answer lies in in um continuing on this uh, tributary uh, system theme for a moment, ideology is at the center of it, right? You can't participate in it if you don't acknowledge this ideology that establishes the ruler of China as the as the son of heaven, uh -huh. gives it this position. And in addition to that, it just happens that the historical way that this movement back and forth, of course, there was an importation of uh, what we would call Confucian ideology into uh, a lot of the surrounding nations, particularly in East Asia. Um, and along with that came the writing system, along with that came the the entire sort of institution of a ruler. How do you have a court? How do people dress at court? How do you do right. legal Now, this isn't pushing the ideology, right? You, right. You, you participate in this system more or less willingly, and you understand the terms of it, which are largely ideological. So there's no, there's no kind of, yes, there's an exportation of the ideology. Um, so are you saying that uh, President Xi Jinping today, I mean, if I may be bold enough to make this comparison, thinks of himself as the son of God and everyone has to be subservient? Is uh, there that translate? I haven't heard that. I mean, I would never, I would never say anything like that. I mean, okay. the PRC is not, the Qing was an empire. I, I mean, right. I can, all the, criteria of empire. The PRC isn't an empire. I mean, we just Correct. We don't have empires today. I so, was thinking more as how the leader of China views itself, views themselves. And But you're I, saying that's not, not a direct one-on-one -on -one comparison to history. I don't think so at all. Xi Jinping's attitude towards Qing history or the entire imperial period in China appears to be quite different from previous uh, leaders of the PRC. Um, but I don't I never heard that he went so far as to make any comparisons between these emperors and himself. It, they, they could be very fanciful uh, references to certain of the emperors. I think he likes to refer to the Qianlong emperor in the 18th century. Right. But uh, no, I don't, I don't have any reason to think that Xi Jinping considers himself a, an emperor of China. And Taiwan, how do you uh, uh, relate that to what's happening today? Well, Taiwan's history is very distinct, right? I mean, we, we, we understand uh, a lot about this. Um, th th it was never a part of a state ruled from China before uh -huh. 1685. Um, wow. And uh, it was it eventually conquered as part of the late dynamics of the, of the Qing conquest of China. They had to take Taiwan because um, of the dynamics of the resistance in southern China. So there was an independent kingdom there. They had the of the Zhang family, these these sort of so called you know pirate kings. They had to destroy that in order to uh, complete their conquest of, of South China. Um, right. Now, Chinese had been moving through the particularly in the Ming period to to Taiwan and settling along the coast, and uh, this was illegal uh, in from the in the eyes of the Ming uh, Empire because Taiwan was definitely not in China. So uh, to leave the country was illegal because you couldn't be taxed anymore. Uh, that was why Zhang He was attacking all of these uh, uh, villages in Indonesia because they were, he regarded them as tax uh, refugees. Ah, 
Okay. So, um, so, so there was a Chinese popu Chinese population farming Chinese speaking in Taiwan at the time that it became part of the Qing Empire, but there was never any Chinese rule of Taiwan before that time. And then, of course, at the end of the Qing, near the end of the Qing Empire, it becomes a Japanese colony. And then its status, legal status, after the surrender of Japan in 1945, very, very murky. Um, but uh, Taiwan has just a distinct history, well known. There isn't, isn't any ambiguity about it. Um, it was never ruled from China before 1680. So may I may I then uh, just uh, interject a provocative question here? So uh, so can we say then uh, that the first time that Taiwan was considered uh, by America as a part of China is when President Nixon opened up the relationship between the two, removed Taiwan from the United Nations, and agreed that there's only one China. The United States, now we're bringing the United States into it. Well, um, I know it's, I, a, it's a reach, no, but please. No, it's not. No, I, I don't think. I mean, there were specific discussion of uh, Taiwan as part of Chinese territory um, and Chinese territory generally beginning as early as Potsdam. So before the end of the Second World War, um, there was already a discussion of how to handle Chinese territories that were under Japanese control. Right. Uh, after the surrender of Japan. Right. Uh, but this had to be refined in the Treaty of San Francisco. And then, you know, there was the Taiwan Treaty with the United States in, mm. in the 50s. And uh, so um, but I, I think the view of the United States was always that um, during the period in which there was no communication to speak of with the PRC. So all through the 50s and the 60s. I mean, Taiwan, it was easy to consider Taiwan is the only representation we have in the in the free world of China. Right, right. That, that was an easy one. But then once Nixon comes along, we have the normalization of relations. There's a more and more of a consensus that, no, we have to acknowledge the PRC as legitimate uh, government of China. Um, I think Taiwan, the American strategy was always let's just be incomplete about this. Let's just be ambiguous. Uh, let's talk about other things and carry on. Taiwan's doing fine. Um, China has plenty of other things to do. Let's just sort of move along. Right. Uh, once in a while, though, the issue gets forced. So I'm going to yank us into the present uh, century today. Uh, in America has huge markets, capital markets, uh, entrepreneurial uh, spirit, uh, great universities like yours, for example, and others. Uh, and what I'm trying to think about now uh, is America isn't going to disappear anywhere, right? But there have been waves over the centuries of powers rising. Uh, there were the Dutch, and they were the center of the world, and all capital flowed into Amsterdam. Then there were the Brits. The United States uh, was dominant until now, China is becoming uh, the second superpower and looking at us eyeball to eyeball. My question is this. America has its own principles, which it isn't going to give up, you know, democracy, freedom of speech, and so on. China's system is very different. Can America and China coexist, not get into this uh, nasty confrontation in which we are now, keep its own systems. I mean, how, how does that work, uh, again, from your historical perspective? Can it be done? Um, I think it can very definitely be done. I think it was done very successfully before the Trump administration. I mean, um, go all through 80s, 90s, even after China joins the WTO, um, which it did with American support, um, and then coming into the to the 21st century. Uh, it's just a matter of having a coherent uh, strategy. I mean, the United States doesn't, hasn't had a policy towards China in the Trump administration. It was just throwing a punch uh, over here, establishing a, a tariff over there, then sort of fawning over Xi Jinping over there. I mean, there was, you know, there was nothing. Um, and so it's a matter of going back to some coherent statement of interests 
um, and treating the other side with respect and uh, being able to sort of just understand there were things about there are things about which we'll disagree, but the, that doesn't mean there has to be big right. trouble about it, right? Right. Right. So, so again, coming back to today and uh, the uh, the United States, may I ask if uh, if uh, you know the common uh, uh, belief is that Mr. Xi Jinping is all powerful, that he's uh, he's appointed himself president for life, uh, but there are other people who say, well, that is true that he's done that, but he still had to get permission from the ruling committee to do that. So do you think that that Xi Jinping is ultimately responsible to the Chinese Communist Party and he has to produce and they can, in fact, remove him if opinion turns against him? Can you shed some light on the the workings of the Communist uh, Party in China? Well, no. There are people who can shed more light than I, but there's nobody who can say they really know all about it because this is a, a system with no transparency and there's a lot of things that can never be documented from the outside and some things that, you know, can be documented over right. the outside. Xi Jinping is very unusual, that's for sure. When you look at the sequence of leadership from Deng Xiaoping forward, uh, there's kind of a belief that Deng Xiaoping might have actually mapped out the subsequent regimes going through Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, um, but never foresaw uh, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is just coming after uh, anything that Deng Xiaoping could have uh, imagined, uh, forecast, or, or sort of programmed. Right. Um, his rise is, um, is interesting in the sense that the, the, the CCP um, all through the 90s and into the 21st century, uh, not consensus, but it's always worked on a kind of balance of power between factions, which can be regional or, or um, policy uh, oriented. And yes, uh, these things have uh, always animated the, uh, the Politburo and uh, the Politburo is supposedly where leadership is ultimately determined and the fate of leadership. But Xi Jinping, once he was in power, was really able to use this anti-corruption campaign to uh, not only intimidate people would, who would otherwise have um, represented some kind of an opposition, but also to really eliminate a kind of generation that would have been his successors, right? So part mm. of the way the Politburo calculates is, um, well, after this 10-year period is over, um, who's going to be the next person we'll move on to, and that helps to end the former regime. And in fact, once you've you've been uh, the president, the secretary, the head of state, and so on, you you just retire. People don't really hear much about you anymore. Mm. It's part of the custom. So Xi Jinping really eliminated uh, likely successors at the same time that he was able to persuade the Politburo, not to make him president for life, but to, to lift this kind of 10 year um, rule so that, uh, you know, in theory, he could, he, could, uh, he could govern for 11 years, right? I mean, um, or for life, whichever. So right. um, he has handled himself in a different way. He's built up a kind of power in the party that really, is not like the power even of Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was the one, I would say, who created a lot of the economic foundation on which Xi Jinping has built. And Xi Jinping has lower growth rates than these earlier regimes. Mm. Uh, but he has built up a kind of power for himself that is very unusual within the party and certainly exceeds the power of those who were, were there before him. And he knows that. So I'm going to switch us in the final closing moments, Professor Crossley, uh, back to America. Uh, here we have, at this point of the 21st century, a China that is rich, a China that uh, is uh, becoming influential around the world with its Belt and Road initiatives, that is uh, pretty much at this point the dominant military factor in, its, uh, in the seas, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Do you think, do you think that the American psyche, and again, I'm asking you to reach from a historical perspective, is ready to accept the fact that 
America may not, after all, be the indispensable nation that we need to walk a little more humbly in the world going forward, because we now have, and these are my words, uh, another superpower, eyeball to eyeball, and it makes no sense to do uh, get into a conflict because both are nuclear powered and the world ceases to exist. How do you parse all this? I thought we might want to end with that. Um, um, okay, it, 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 it may not be a, a brief or sudden ending. I mean, I'll just qualify everything I'm about to say. I don't believe there's any psyche, any national psyche. So um, uh -huh. I, there's opinion that comes from various directions and, and that is probably something that can be um, uh, discussed. This indispensable nation thing, I mean, I do, uh, I, you talk to a lot of people in policy, so do I. You, you, do you hear anybody talk about indispensable nation? I never have. One person, Madeleine Albright, said this one time in, in a TV interview. And the only the, the stuff that I read about it subsequent to that is people who want to refute it. What are they refuting? I mean, this is not the opinion of any people who are significant in American policy making. Ah. I think the closest you can get to it would be if you go back to the beginning of the 21st century, the what we, the people we now refer to as the neocons, right? The people who sort of uh, were behind the whole uh, the war in Iraq. I'm not sure they considered the U.S. the indispensable nation, but they certainly thought America should have the last word about mm. everything. I mean, that's a discredited policy. There aren't, nobody's following this. We can see the disaster for Iraq, disaster for the United States, eventually disaster for the global economy. I mean, this, this, is, not, this is not considered the particularly persuasive approach anymore. So um, I don't think that there's anybody in America invested in this idea of indispensable nation. It's used by people who want to use it as a straw man, right? To begin to refute any kind of uh, claims that America might have to, to power. Um, so I think as far as China is concerned, yes, there is- Do you is think the Chinese know that? Do you think their power structure knows that? Some of them probably do, but the, the point is if you want to preface anything you're about to say with a statement that is somehow rather discrediting to the U.S., you're going to use this phrase because ah. there it is, right? And it, it's a handy straw man. And so, you know, you can spend your whole time spitting this huge refutation of it when, in fact, why? Um, I think there are sectors of, of the Chinese uh, policymaking establishment that understand America pretty well. And I think there are others that probably don't. And I don't think that, and I think that they're kind of um, distributed across the military, across the party, across the economic planning sectors. Okay. Uh, so, and it will change. But I did, last August, I wrote a, th a thing in um, uh, China File that I still, I believe even more strongly now, which is we worry a lot about how much the United States understands China, but how much does China really understand the United States, particularly in the post-Trump era? I mean, I think the United States is now, for various reasons, going to go through some uh, pretty significant changes, not sudden, but they will be substantial, right. in terms of culture and political outlook. And I think that there is probably, within five, ten years, going to be a much closer connection between uh, domestic ideology and foreign policy. And a lot of it is going to focus on democracy in a way that American foreign policy has not focused on democracy in a serious way uh, ever. I mean, when they talked about democracy in the 20th century, they just meant capitalism. Um, in the 21st century, I think this is actually going to mean democracy. And there's going to en enter some kind of a value discourse uh, related to supporting societies who are living successfully in a democratic way, um, which doesn't mean state building, right? It, it, it means, you know, making choices. Right. You know? So uh, I, I think, you know, the United States, I don't think there's any difficulty accepting what China is. I mean, China is, this is China. It was China in the 18th century when the United States was nothing but a couple little ships floating around. And <laughs> this is China, and this is China now. And what a uh, structural reasons why China returns to this position in the global economy, overwhelming structural reasons. 
And there's Americans, you know, Americans think in terms of per capita GDP, right? In per capita GDP, there isn't anything to compare between the United States and China. Um, everybody lives with per capita GDP. Nobody lives with in a national GDP. So I don't think there's anxiety on the part of Americans about China's economic position. Now, right. when it comes to military challenges, I think this comes and goes. Um, uh, this the, the South China Sea is something that has to be examined. I think there will probably be a lot of discussion about China's um, role in Latin America um, and in Africa, and to the degree to which the United States wants to do some kind of a face-to-face -face thing there. Those are choices to be made, but. Um, uh, there's nobody feels an existential threat from China in the United States, okay. either economically or militarily. Well, we could go on for a long time. Let me apologize again for uh, the gods of the internet when we started, uh, but I want to really thank you for taking some of your very, very busy time and bringing your authoritative expertise to launch this program. And if I haven't mentioned it before, I want to mention it now for our viewers uh, that uh, this is being conducted with the Foreign Policy Association and that at the end of the three months in the conversations, there will be a report issued by the Foreign Policy Association that will be widely circulated to uh, the policymakers in Washington and to the incoming administration. So with that, my many thanks again, Dr. Crossley, and we hope to see you again on Polaris Live.